I'm going to uh, begin by saying that in all of my lifetime, I felt that anti-Semitism was only growing fainter and fainter. Um, I certainly heard stories about like law firms that used to not hire Jews, and the fact that there was a lot of anti-Semitism and kids would get beaten up on the playgrounds, those kinds of stories, but um, certainly not so much in my lifetime. And by the time we got to 2008, there was a journalist who actually proclaimed when Aaron Lieberman, uh, uh, Joseph Lieberman was running for vice president when there were several Ivy League presidents that were Jews, when there were so many Jews in Congress and Senate. They basically declared that anti-Semitism in America was over. Um, now that feels so naive. So we are now in a, for the first time I think in my life, we're moving in the wrong direction on anti-Semitism. And I'm wondering, Deborah, um, how did we get here? Well. Um, first of all, I want to say about those hikes, I also learned a lot about you and became totally enamored and I congratulate you on having one of the best rabbis in America. Um, and a good friend of mine and someone whose friendship I treasure. And I even got to hold Rosie when she was tiny, yes. tiny, right? Um, along the Roaring Forks River in Aspen. Okay, and the end of memory lane. How did we get here? Um, you know, you have to think, I'm sorry I can't see the people there, but you could get seats here if you wanted, so I can, you know, so I don't feel too guilty about it, but I'm sorry, you're getting my shoulder. Um, Anti-Semitism is called the longest or the oldest hatred. It, it has deep-seated roots. Um, I trace the roots to the New Testament. Um, if you think about the story of the death of Jesus in the New Testament, in, in that story, um, Jesus, the Jews, now Jesus is Jewish, everybody is Jewish in the story except the Romans who actually kill him, but that's a, a fact that we get that, rid of those. The Jews want to have Jesus killed, why? Because he wants to chase the money changers out of the temple. And what does he do? He convinces the reluctant, Ro they convince the reluctant Romans to do this crucifixion, uh, crucifixion. So think about it, right there you have the template of anti-Semitism. Money, smarts, they figure out how to do this, power, and nefarious use of that power. They can get Rome, think, it's not just Rome who is really Jerusalem, Rome is the most powerful entity in the world and they get to do that. That's the template for anti-Semitism. So if you want, if so you hear something that makes you slightly uncomfortable, think, checklist, does it have something to do with money? Does it have something to do with power? That's why we bristle when we hear the terms the Jewish lobby or the Israel lobby in a way that, that the steel lobby doesn't bristle when it hears the steel lobby because there's that implication of nefarious use of power. So we're talking about something that's been here for a very long time. How did we get to where we are today? I think I talk about it, and I've written about this, some of you may have seen it, it's a perfect storm. It's coming from the right um, in terms of populist leaders who, have, who themselves are either anti-Semitic or who have a base that has a strong anti-Semitic, often racist, um, element to it, and they stir up that base, and they want the support of that base, and they're not willing to condemn the anti-Semitism that goes along with it. And we see it on the left. We see it very much on the left. Uh, we see it in the criticism of Israel, and I want to stress this, and you know, maybe it's bringing coals to Newcastle to a, an audience such as this. I'm not talking about criticism of Israeli policies. Last week I was in Sweden, I've just come back. So there's a guest of a governmental agency in connection to Holocaust Remembrance Day, and the Israeli ambassador to, to Sweden stood up and said, criticism of Israeli policies is not anti-Semitism. But when you question the right of Israel to have a state, of Israel to be a state, even if it has done wrongs, and every country has done wrongs in its founding and its history. I'll just name a few, America, Canada, Australia. You don't have to go to Syria, you know, Sudan and the others, et cetera. Um, when you use, uh, when you express anti-Semitism but hide it behind the guise of a criticism of Israel. I'll give you two examples of that. The, the 
blood hadn't been cleaned off the floor of the Pittsburgh synagogue, and I use that graphic description, I mean, it was immediate. A left liberal labor party, or actually liberal party, but very much to the left, member of the House of Lords named Jenny Tong, wrote, this is horrible, this is a disaster. When will Netanyahu learn that his policies are all wrong? Now, she immediately went to that. And I'll give you an example closer to home, which is more painful for many of us. Alice Walker, I'm sure you will follow, follow the contretemps and Alice Walker in the New York Times Book Review, uh, where she uh, highly recommended a book on her, ni on her night table, which is such a book by a wingnut that's so far out of, this gives wingnuts a bad name, you know? <laughs> it's a book that a publisher contracted to publish and refused to publish because it was so anti-Semitic. When she was criticized for it, what did she say? She said, oh, this is just an effort to silence me, I'm paraphrasing here, on my views on the Palestinians. So immediately, the Israel, you know, criticism of it, and you're not allowed to criticize Israel or, you know, even saying, I'm very brave, I'm going to criticize. So we have it on the right, we have it on the left, Jeremy Corbyn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have a third source, which again is a painful source for many of us. First of all, the jihadists. If you think of every um, example of an attack on a Jewish institution, uh, virtually every violent attack in Europe, not in this country, but in Europe, it's by, been by an Islamist jihadist. And um, there's another source in the Muslim community. Um, and that is people who would never think of picking up a gun, a machete, a weapon, of doing anything violent, but who hear anti-Semitic rants, either from imams or uh, YouTube, uh, whatever it might be, um, and who internalize this anti-Semitism. The rabbi in, at the Grand Synagogue in Sweden, I was talking to her after um, Shabbat services last Shabbat, and she said to me, very interesting person, she said to me that she has members of her congregation, the you know, Grand Synagogue, if you maybe have been there, the Great Synagogue, it's right in the center of, um, the right on the edge of the old city in the center of Stockholm, um, who are teachers and who teach in suburbs, not in Stockholm Central, but in suburbs and southern little south of the city, and with, with many new arrivals, euphemism for Muslim immigrants, and they don't tell their students that they're Jewish. They never reveal that they're Jewish because they know that well, these students have, been, have this anti-Semitism bred in them. So it's populism. It's uh, a certain amount of economic dislocation, and it's the fact that when things are, anti-Semitism, I described it after Pittsburgh to Lori Goodstein, who was then a uh, religion editor at the New York Times, as a herpes. You know, if you get a herpes virus, how many of you have heard of a, a bride on the morning of her wedding wakes up with a cold, with a herpes sore, you know, because it comes out when it's this stress. Anti-Semitism comes out when there's stress, and here it is. Thank you for that great overview. I mean, the horrifying overview as well. Um, I think in part, this conversation was prompted by a lot of agitation that's been building over, um, you know, this year in particular, um, around how um, the, just the national discourse feels very different. When you have kind of um, icons like you know, progressive icons like an Alice Walker or Michelle Alexander who wrote the op-ed in the Times that many of you read, um, I think it becomes particularly hard that this becomes sort of just the discourse. And let's just talk about that op-ed for a minute because I think that many of us, um, I certainly heard from a lot of you and I know that when I read it, it like really put a pit in my stomach. Um, I wanna begin by saying, first of all, I think part of the reason it was hard is that she was naming some truths about some ugly stuff that is happening to Palestinians in the occupied territory. I'm just gonna name that. And that needs to be said because it's not that everything in there is um, not true. And not only that, but we as a Jewish community need to grapple with that. And I think that we have been, but I think that she's trying to put that out there. In addition to that, though, she put it in a frame of kind of calling it basically apartheid. Um, she lifted up Jewish Voices for Peace, which is a very fringe organization, but kind of lifted almost as if it's representing a mainstream Jewish voice. Um, she basically uh, talked about supporting BDS, um, and, and which is in some ways really looking to make 
Israel not exist anymore. So all of these things that I think were very problematic. In addition, she put it on Martin Luther King Day, which was very deliberate, and as, as an icon of um, basically criminal justice and racial justice reform in this country, for her to put that deliberately on MLK Day and talk about Jews in Israel helps kind of further put a wedge between Jews and this issue of criminal justice. So we're put in this incredibly painful, terrible place. Um, I was gonna ask you about what is the difference between being critical of Israel and being anti-Semitic? Oh, I will throw in there that she also kind of threw out the dog whistle of Jews using their money to get what they wanted in terms and of And I'll be denying... very brave in writing this, you know. Right, uh, yeah, Breaking the Silence was the, was the name of the title, which is not exactly Breaking the Silence. We've been talking about this, but you know, so there were things thrown in, like the way Jews use their money to make sure that Angela Davis doesn't get an award. So tell me about like your response to that. How that how how do you um, give an answer to those of us who are struggling with some of the things that I think that we know we need to struggle with, and then the pieces that frame it in such a way that it really demonizes Jews in Israel. Um, I think that our article was so over the top, and for a smart person, I don't. Obviously, she's been reading and listening to some very uh, far left people on on this topic. Um, I thought that that article really expressed views that were anti-Semitic. I mean, there's no question about it. I don't want to call Michelle Goldberg. Uh, uh, Alexandra, I conflated two people. Um, Michelle Alexandra, an anti-Semite, but there was a repetition of those views that were anti-Semitic. Um, and I think you're right uh, to, to call out exactly what's wrong. There are things that are wrong. There are things that leave us very distressed. And if you want to read expressions of that distress, go to haaretz.com on a daily basis, and you'll see expressions of that distress. Um, I think the tropes about Israel, I mean, forgetting that over half the population of Israel, I think it's now over half, or at least half, a Jews of color, exactly, um, you know, is, is forgotten. Now, has there been racism to those, towards those Jews of color in, for, for generations? There was, yes, absolutely. Um, but A, that's changing, and B, I mean, the fact is that this is not a white nation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that one was, it, it just left me dumbfounded. It really left me dumbfounded. And what, what struck me was exactly what you pulled out. How she sort of said, you know, the dog whistle of Jewish money, I'm going to be brave here and say this as if nobody has said any of this before, as if the Zionist police will come after you. Now, it is true that there are secret, there are Jewish groups that we can't identify who are doing this identifying of people, and they might identify me because I'm critical of Bibi Netanyahu in the book, you know, for some of the things he's done. Um, uh, and, and you wonder, how, but why on a book on anti-Semitism? Well, you can ask me that later. Um, uh, or read even read better, the book. read the book, right, thank you. Um, but that, that article was very disturbing, and I think you're right to point out that it came out on Martin Luther King Day, and um, this uh, focus, not to say we shouldn't be focusing on the Palestinians and some of the uh, suffering that they, that they do endure and some of the humiliations that they do endure. Um, but there are others in this world that, that just go unnoticed, unmentioned. And at some point, you've got to ask, why this singular focus? Why this focus on this and not on other things as well? Not to say that this shouldn't be focused on. But why this alone to all others? There was a academic group that was going to uh, uh, was proposing a BDS boycott, and when the head of the group, a prominent professor, was asked, "Well, why start? Why Israel? I mean, you have so many other." And she said, "Well, you have to start somewhere. That's not a good answer. That's not a sufficient answer." I know a high school student here who um, asked for a recommendation for a summer program in Israel, and the teacher had originally said yes when he found out it was for Israel. He um, said, I won't, I won't write a recommendation for Israel. And um, That happened here? It happened in a public school in New York. Wow, because yeah. Michigan, we know, it, we know the story in Michigan, that got a lot of attention. Yes, it sure did, uh -huh. but it's, it's, hap it's happening more and more. Really? When she pressed him and said, is there any other country that you would not be willing to write a recommendation mm -hmm. for? China, Saudi Arabia, anywhere. He said no. 
He said, just Israel. He's Jewish, by the way. So, um, and, uh, and, and I'm sure he said, as a Jew. Well, he, when you, you know, hear as those a Jew, but, words, and when she a pressed Jew. a little bit more, he said, well, there's a movement on this. There's not a movement on the others. So it's kind of like cyclical. Because apparently people are already pushing for this, then this is the one that we'll focus on and not the others. So I, I really, it is um, it's becoming much more. I'll rare. write a recommendation for that student that she pushed Thank back you. is great. <laughs> That's true. Great. Um, but let's talk about BDS for a moment because fighting BDS has become a, um, a kind of a communal focus of like organized Jewish communities. And this is not an easy thing to fight. Um, there are, by the way, people who would argue that why should we be fighting the one, one of the few forms of nonviolent resistance that people who are not in power have to fight what you know, they need to fight. So there's an argument for that. If this was coming just from the Palestinian community, I think it would feel different, but I think that it, historically it actually came out of um, a community that really wanted to um, eradicate the state of Israel. But let's say that I'm presuming that you're anti-BDS and, and you can talk about that, but I'm actually more interested in how we should be responding to it because right now a lot of the response is to um, say we are going to squelch free speech on this and I think that it hasn't been particularly helpful when you have Texas basically say we're gonna pass an anti-BDS law and anyone who gets any government funding or is an employee of the state has to, to prove that they're anti-BDS or they can't so it creates bad stories like you know a school teacher who teaches special needs that gets fired for her job because she's not willing to sign an anti-BDS thing I know you are a champion of free speech I will give you one example when David Irving, her horrible Holocaust denier who tried to sue her, was actually given jail time in Austria of three years for his horrible lies that he spread, you actually spoke up and said, I don't think he should be put in prison. People should not be put in jail for, for, their, for speech. We shouldn't be censoring. And so you clearly are a proponent of free speech and not censoring even people who spread lies. So tell me like, what you think is our response to BDS if you're in, I'm Before gonna. Before I get to the BDS yes. thing, I just, some of you may have seen me on I'm Important Company with Walter mm -hmm. Isaacson, which was a treat. Um, but uh, it, I, I made that point there. But one of the things I didn't say that now, I, you know, I listened to it, I shouted, I should have said, I should have said, um, that I am a, su a strong supporter of the First Amendment. It's hanging on by its fingernails, ladies and gentlemen, but we still have got it. Um, is that at the same time, that doesn't mean papers and individuals have, an, whatever entity, social media, you should be repeating these things. It calls for judgment, but not for law. So on that, I'm absolutely still stand there. BD, I know kids who've joined BDS, who support BDS, who to declare them anti-Semitic is just wrong. They see it as, oh, well, this is a non exactly as you describe it, Angela, as a nonviolent attempt to change the policies of the state of Israel. This is like my parents who, who protested for uh, apartheid, or, or my grandparents who protested for apartheid, and things like that. And, uh, but I think the BDS effort, as you say again so correctly, was organized and started by, and at its heart, calls for the destruction of the state of Israel. Um, and that's what it's all about. Uh, right of return for everyone, not just the uh, um, people who, were, who might have been forced out or who left, um, but for you know, four generations thereafter. Um, they call for a um, one state solution, uh, you know, a democratic state. Well, tell me, name one other Muslim dominated state where the religious minority is doing well, you know, and uh, I'll use that as an example. There is none. Um, so, um, you know, I think that, that one has to look beyond BDS. And, and say, what is it about? And it's about the, what I call in the book the toxification of Israel, making Israel toxic. Some of you may have been Carnegie Hall yesterday um, to hear Perlman and the IPO and Yoel Levy conducting um, uh, uh, for a concert, a concert. And outside, of course, there was a, a BDS, an anti-Israel demonstration, and then pro-Israel demonstration. It was a, a shouting match. I was very happy to go into the concert. Um, <laughs> But um, it's, I think, 
I think to some degree, the community, I think there should be a fight against BDS, but this effort of we should get every uh, uh, you know, state to pass a law outlawing is very dangerous. I'm not even talking about morality here. Forget the morality of the First Amendment. I'm just talking about strategically. It's a strategic danger. There's a group of academics, the Academic Engaged Network, which is an anti-BDS group of academics, and one of our great arguments it's led by Mark Udoff, former chancellor of the University of California system and before that president of the University of Texas. Um, and one of our great arguments is that Israel is a democratic entity. It's a democratic entity with free speech and the right to criticize. So the minute you start engaging in the other stuff uh, or moving to the other direction, you're losing the narrative. And I think Yet when they take 23 year old BDS activists and not allow them to come into the state of Israel, it's stupid. definitely strategically it's just, a First big of all, morally, problem. et cetera, the, this kid has been accepted to a program at the Hebrew University, but it's just idiocy. Mm -hmm. It's just stupid. It, it proves that not all Jews are smart. That's <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk for a moment about the Women's March. And I think the, the tremendous frustration in the Jewish community um, around it just uh, let's just name first to begin with perhaps some stories that are that had, had come out around some anti-Semitism that has been present along from the very beginning, but also I think in particular kind of really gelled um, with the inability of the leadership of the march to really denounce Farrakhan, who is a vile anti-Semite and is not a, it's not a secret at all what he says um, horrible things. I heard you speak at the ADL conference. Um, a, a month and a half ago, and you spoke very forcefully in front of 1,300 people, and you said to Jews, do not go to the march. So um, tell us why you feel so strongly. Well, I think, you know, you encapsulate it. Um, I love being interviewed by you because you provide me the answers. <laughs> um, this is my many conversations yeah, with you. I know what right, you're thinking right. about. But. We talk, you know, people listen, they don't understand what we're talking about because we're talking to have sentences. Well, yep, let's go in there. Oh, yep. Um, but that's exactly right. You had leadership of the march that we didn't even know the full degree has only come out recently that from the very outset did not want to include anti-Semitism, did not see anti-Semitism as a legitimate cause. Now, maybe to move away from the Women's March and bring me back to it if I forget, but I think it's very important to understand something here. For pe many people who call themselves progressives, like a Jeremy Corbyn, like uh, the women at the head of the Women's March, so I think that's even more complicated. Um, their view of the world is refracted through a prism that has two facets. Remember, prisms bend light, bend your view, shape your view. And those two facets, one facet is ethnicity, and the other facet is class. So they look at Jews, not at your rabbi, and they see um, white Anglo-Saxon Jews, you know, they see white people, and they see people of privilege. And they say, ipso facto, white people of privilege cannot be the objects of prejudice or discrimination. It's, you know, they forget the fact that Jews in Germany who were very, not all were privileged, but there were those, uh, you know, solid middle class, et cetera, et cetera. But that's history. Again, ignore that. Um, so they say, ipso facto, you can't be a victim. Therefore, you must be claiming this for some other reason. And then you get the Alice Walker comment, ah, it's just to, to attack me for being pro-Palestinian. Or, you know, Corbyn saying it's just because I, you know, like the Palestinians or I'm critical of Israel or that kind of thing. Um, and the other thing that's part of the progressive kind of mantra is um, I'm a progressive. I've been fighting for equal rights from the, I, I went to marches in my stroller, you know, my parents took me to marches in my stroller. How could I possibly be prejudiced? And again, ipso facto, you must, therefore, you must be making it up, and you must be making it up for some other reason to attack me for my positions. So that's the framework. And to some degree, Pittsburgh destroyed that momentarily. Momentarily, because I think they're gonna forget that very quickly. 
Um, uh, we didn't need Pittsburgh. That's why I said after Pittsburgh, I was uh, shocked but not surprised. You know, um, so that's the framework with they look on it, and they see Jews more than just as privileged and white. And it's ironic because from the right wing, the far right wing does not see Jews as white. Um, more than just privileged and white, but oppressors. So when you come to me and say all these things, you know, you're just not legitimate. And don't call on me to say that this oppressive state has a right to exist. And don't call on me to say that anti-Semitism is legitimate. As I say, until Pittsburgh, that sort of, they, they love dead Jews. Dead Jews are great, but not live Jews. And I, I, I don't say that to be funny, but that's, that's, that's really true. Uh, you can commemorate Holocaust Remembrance Day, but give me a live Jew who's object of anti-Semitism, and there must be something that Jew did. Um, and that's what we saw in the Women's March. Um, and I think these uh, these women who became leaders somehow they became they I don't know you know even the tablet has done a very extensive uh, uh, analysis of that and expose of that um, carried that with them. And yes, you know, someone was trying to explain that uh, someone like a Tamika Mallory is very indebted to a Nation of Islam and Reverend Farrakhan for helping her family. That's okay, you can be indebted. But when the leader of the, you know, I may have someone, I wrote this in Hadassah magazine, um, I may have someone with whom I agree politically on 98% of the issues. But if they use the N word, or they dress up in blackface, <laughs> as we're hearing this morning. Um, I'm not gonna march behind them. There are, you know, at kan veloya avor, the, 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 the statement in Jewish tradition, to this point and no further. Mayim ad nafesh, you know, uh, from, the, from the scriptures, from the Hebrew scriptures, water, water has come to my very soul, I'm drowning. There's certain things that are deal breakers. And when Reverend Farrakhan says, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-termite, we know, what do you do when you have termites? Who do you call? See under Nazis. We know the answer to that. Now, they didn't say it, but that should be a deal breaker. And when it's not, especially we're not marching for, you know, let's get rid of the bike lane or let's put in the bike lane. We're marching against prejudice. So when people who are supposedly against prejudice are facilitating this kind of statement, I can't be there. Now, I did say people should march in the individual marches and that, I think the issue is extremely important. The issue is crucial, even more crucial, given all that's happened. Because the people who would like to fight the issue say, aha, they're killing each other. We just sit back and watch them kill each other. But um, these people are not legitimate leaders, to my mind. So I think that the place that this puts me in that has been like really deeply challenging, and I'm going to ask you about this, is that I, I agree. I, I didn't march in the Women's March either the first time or the second time, and with my own internal struggles with what I saw even from the beginning. Um, that being said, I think it becomes a very big problem when Jews don't show up in these spaces. And I will share that I had the opportunity to speak um, with a small group of rabbis, with Tamika Mallory and with Linda Sarsour, two of the leaders of the march. And when, when I asked her very directly, why are you not able to denounce Farrakhan? She said, I've denounced his hate, I've denounced his anti-Semitism. She said, but I have learned in Kingian nonviolence, you don't denounce the person, you denounce the ideas. Then she said, you have to know that when my, the father of my child was killed, that you know, the Nation of Islam helped me. And she said, and now that son is a 19-year-old black man. And she said, and do you know who are the lowest of the low in America? Young black men. And she said, and do you know that who is showing up for them in the prisons? Nation of Islam. Who is giving them jobs when they come out of prison? She said, Nation of Islam. So she said, so when the people who don't actually care about my son or men like him in America are telling me that I need to denounce the one man who's actually helped my community, she said, I'm not gonna do it. And she said this with great passion, and I heard what she was saying, and it was a deep challenge to me. At the same time, I said, you understand that he is lifting up your community by saying, 
it's their fault, the Jews. So you have to understand that that's hate is hate. And I think if she were to remain a leader of her black community, she could actually keep holding those views in some ways, but she wanted to be the leader of a national movement for women, which I think is a very different thing. That being said, there was a charge that I think is something that the Jewish community needs to hear about where we're showing up in spaces. And when we say we're out of the Women's March because of anti-Semitism, which I completely understand why we were, but there is so much we need to work on around women's issues. When we say we're out of the Black Lives Matter movement because there were pieces of their platform that talked about Israel as an apartheid state with genocide. When we say we might be out, which a few people from this congregation actually wrote to me and to Rabbi Auerbach and said, we don't know that we want to be in the criminal justice reform world if people like Michelle Alexander, who are the leaders of that movement, are putting out something that feels anti-Semitic. Are we going to just put ourselves out of every movement that is for justice that we've actually, Jews have been a part of, from feminism to racial justice to just other issues of justice? So what is the danger here of this idea that Jews become this island where we are not willing to do, and if the litmus test is anti-Semitism, and this is what's happening in the world, are we going to get to a place where Jews are nowhere at the table well, for these issues? Well, that's like the review in the Jerusalem Post of my book where I said, because you know, I have, the book is written as letters in the conversation. I didn't tell the story, I talked in there, right? Yes, yes. I don't remember, I've been interviewed so many times, including three times this morning. Tell the story. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, in the book, I, this is, the, the book is written as a series of letters between me and a Jewish student. Uh, who's, these are c uh, fictional characters, but they're composites of real questions and emails that I've gotten from students over the years, and a non-Jewish colleague who's in the law school who is uh, asking you know, questions he feels he can't ask in other ways about Jews and anti-Semitism, et cetera. So one of the questions the student asked me, she tells me that she, some of her roommates and others have said to her, well, why is it that Jews are so hated? What have they done that's gotten them so hated? And what, you know, it, it, the internalization of the anti-Semitism and, um, and taking, the, taking the view that it's correct. And she said, what am I supposed to tell them? And I said, you go back and you answer them and you show them an anti-Semitism. Well, the review in the uh, Jerusalem Post said, she should have told them, go find other friends. That's a view that you're exactly expressing. And if we were to do that with everything and everyone, we would be A, an island. And some people say, so we'll be an island. But then you have no influence on changing things. So it puts us in uncomfortable positions. And you know, I applaud that you were, you were at that meeting and, and, and asked tough issues. And that answer that, you know, so who was there for them you create a vacuum. You create a vacuum, and then you know all the more so we should be involved in criminal justice. All the more so we should be involved in these issues as Jews. As Jews, my Jewish tradition compels me to stand up for the poor, the stranger. I mean, that's what, after relig uh, so-called religious Shabbat and other things, you know, injunctions, that's one of the most oft-repeated commandments in the Torah. Ger, yatom, almanah, the stranger, the orphan, the, the widow. So we have to do that. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't ever answer, and I'm saying something publicly, which I've never said publicly before, but maybe you're making me be more confessional or something. <laughs> I do read the comments on some of the posts and the tweets I put up. Uh, generally, people say, oh, she doesn't read them. She doesn't answer. I, uh, but, but some of them are so mind-bogglingly stupid um, that they're really, some are amusing. Um, but, uh, um, but the idea of why even try, give it up, Liberals, it's all about the liberal. It's what it is, is the right refusing to see the anti Semitism on the right and the left refusing to see the anti Semitism on the left. And one of the pleas of the book is that deal with the anti Semitism that's next to you before you look across the political transom. And that's, I think, where Jews have also made a mistake in recent years. I think that's so true, and we need to be showing up. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'll share one thing that I learned. I don't think I'm um, sharing something I'm not allowed, but I, I'm part of a, uh, a wonderful task force out of the UJA around community relations that our own Jeff Stern is 
co-chairing, and, um, and they commissioned a study of like what the larger social justice world perceives of Jews, and um, it, it was fascinating, and I'm, I'm not gonna give away too much, but I will say that one of the things that came across from several of these comments that were both um, a large sales study of organizations that receive funding, as well as places like NAACP to like, you know, Chinese immigrant refugee group and other things, um, was they said, you know, we know that there are a lot of individual Jews that are showing up in these spaces, but not organized Jewish communities. And the second was, they said, a lot of times we don't see Jews until they're upset about something. They come when they're upset about Israel or upset about anti-Semitism or BDS. And so that is a narrative that we have to be very mindful of. I'm not saying whether it's true or not. I'm just telling you this is a perception that is really dangerous and feeds into what this is. And the more Jews say, okay, we're out, I think the more that creates a, a very big problem. We need to be able to stay at the table and be in there and not those people out there that get more demonized because we don't know them. Um, I will share that one other comment when I had with Linda Sarsour and I shared some of the ways that I felt deeply distressed by some of the things that she had said. The first thing she said was, I don't have enough of these honest conversations with Jews and it's really important. So this is part of what we need to be a part of. And by the way, there are people in my community who say you should never sit down at a table and talk to her. So this is, you know, there are different strategies here. I feel like for us to get out and see this is incredibly dangerous. Um, I'm gonna do one last question, um, and then I wanna open it up to the community, but you are on a college campus. You are living what the life is that um, our children, I happen to have a college freshman myself, are hearing, and we hear terrible stories. I think this fall there was a story about Michigan you mentioned with two different professors wouldn't write a recommendation for Israel, but more than that, there were like classes where they showed the PowerPoint that like literally put Hitler and Bibi Netanyahu next to each other as equivalencies and put a little mustache on Netanyahu. Um, these are the kinds of things being taught in, in some of our universities, and we know what, what the tenor is like. How much of that is really what you see, given your vantage point, and what you know of college campuses, and how much, and, and what, what do our kids need to know, and how can they be prepared? Um, I can't do that in the, in the whole time we have left. Okay, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> I think, first of all, to be talking about the campus as a quote-unquote hotbed of anti-Semitism way overstates the case. We Jews love to overstate cases, and it way overstates the case. Does that say there isn't anti-Semitism on campus? I'd be crazy to say that. Uh, but I think one of the first things we have to recognize is that there's a vibrant Jewish life on campus. There, you know, Jewish, uh, the Slivka Center, where your son is, the Jewish center at, where your son is at school. Uh, Emory has a, a active Hillel, Chabad, uh, different Jewish groups. I mean, a campus is not a campus anymore. I, we couldn't say this 25 years ago. One of the people greatly responsible for this was Edgar, the late lamented, my good friend, and my good friend of many people here, Edgar Bronfman, who helped uh, revitalize with so many other people the Hillel movement. Um, so, uh, the, and Jewish studies, no good university. None of the top 100 universities, colleges and universities, considers itself to be offering a complete program unless it has a good Jewish studies program. No more than, when, like when I started my career, we have a professor of Jewish studies. Oh, what we call Koboynik, they did everything, you know? Um, <laughs> And, uh, but now, you know, you need someone in Jewish history, modern Jewish history, ancient rabbinics, literature, uh, linguistics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. At Emory, I think we have 15 people or something like that to one degree or another teaching Jewish studies. Um, so there is a lot of positive stuff there. I think we also have to send kids off prepared, uh, prepared not, you know, to the barricades, but prepared too often they've gotten a view that is a simplistic view to know that there are wrongs that Israel has done. Otherwise, they, what they come out is they said, I was sold the bill of goods. Nothing is, you know, is, is true. Um, and to recognize the call, the occupation and occupation, whatever you think should be the case, you may call it an occupation and say there's no way of resolving it, but to acknowledge the wrongs. Um, 
and to be prepared for that, to be prepared for that, and to be prepared for how some people will see them, will see them as white, privileged, um, and, and, and their, their liberal uh, feelings as sort of, you know, can't be genuine, et cetera. But not to send them off as if they're prepared to do battle. My good friend Chaim Seidlerfeller, at, uh, uh, now uh, Hillel Director Emeritus at UCLA, told me a story recently of Hillel students who had engaged in a year-long desperate fight. Um, and Chaim is very much a man of the left, as, ma as many people know, um, against BDS, against the student effort on BDS. And they lost. And they came to Shabbat service, Friday night services, which at UCLA Hillel are known as vibrant, exciting, lovely events. Non-Jews come. You know, it's just a place for many students to be on Friday night. And uh, he said, among the, amongst the things he said to the activists who had been involved, he said, you fought, you fought a good battle, you lost, and now you have to go on with your college career. This can't be four years of fighting. You know, and he wasn't saying them that we, but they, they had lost that battle. It's, it's a difficult time, it's a different time, but we shouldn't send the students off a, that would say to them, it's going to be a hotbed and you're going to be in a continuous fight. Because you know what many of the students will decide? Four years, I'm checking out, you know, on Jewish things. Or when I need, uh, you know, Seder, I'll get on the train, I'll take them, you know, to Metro North, I'll take the Metro North, I'll come home. Um, you know, m my parents know people in the, this town. If I need a, a, a service or it's Rosh Hashanah, I can't go home because of classes or whatever it is, they'll arrange. I, or maybe I'll go to Rosh Hashanah things. But when it's just a Jewish affair, I'm not going, I'm not identifying. You have Jews, to use a, a, a statement from another form of prejudice, going back into the closet and I think so there's a very delicate balance here that has to be uh, sort of the students have to be shown that they're going out into the real world will you give us a couple of the stories we talked about oh, yes. dentist whatever thank you kind of okay end on, end on these notes I also think we have to remember something else thank you for the prompt um, in the book, uh, I, I, the student comes to me, as students have said, and says, I was home with my grandparents, and they said the campus is a hotbed of anti-Semitism, and that just doesn't correspond with my experience here at Emory. And um, I reminded this, I tell three stories. One of Emory Dental School. Emory used to have a dental school. It closed it down a number of, quite a few years ago. But it had a dental school with a dean who was an overt anti-Semit, you know, no question about it. And he didn't control the admissions process, but what he did control is once the students got in, whether they could be flunked out or not. The Times covered this, actually, uh, when we went the aftermath of it. And um, so the Jewish students, you know, there would be three or four Jewish men, never women, who would be admitted each year. Now, the same thing in the medical school. You have three or four Jewish men admitted, but they did fabulously well. And once they were in, the medical school treated them as if they were anyone else. Um, but the uh, dental students, he would say, Jews don't have it in the hands for dentistry. <laughs> and they do the carvings of the tooth, it would be broken, it would be thrown away, it would be no good, they would be flunked. And these Jewish guys, this is in the 50s, uh, the, mainly in the 50s, uh, early 60s, but mainly late 40s, early 50s, uh, would come home and tell their parents, you know, I, I flunked out. And the, and the mothers, some of them immigrants, they, I, I heard these stories from the, from the people to whom this happened, would say, couldn't you have studied a little bit harder? Or, you know, they were so proud, my son going to be the dentist, my son is going to dental school. And it was a terrible, terrible thing. Fast forward to an event at Emory, we're having an event at Emory uh, celebrating 40 years of Jewish studies there. And there, one of the people who did step up to the plate was a guy named Art Levin, who was head of the ADL in um, uh, in, in Atlanta. He believed them. The other members of the Jewish community would say, these kids are just carping. They didn't work hard. The other leaders of the Jewish community wouldn't listen to them. He believed them. He did the study. And he showed the degree of failure in the dental school of Jewish students to the general degree of failure, the degree of failure of Jewish students as opposed to the medical school, that it was completely out of whack. I'm standing at the exhibit next to a friend of mine, Perry Brickman, an active member of the Jewish community, been president of Hillel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he looks at the chart and he says to his wife, oh my God, I didn't know I was part of that group. I mean, it had happened to him. And 
and um, he determined that he was going to go and find these other guys. And he traveled around the United States, and he found them. Some were now thoracic surgeons. You know, one guy said, I came home. I sat around for a week. I said, I don't know what to do with myself. I failed. I'll go to medical school, you know. Um, and most of them highly successful. Some of them had never told their family or their medical partners that this had happened. It was a shemzach, you know, shame I tell my partner with whom I, who trusts me to take care of, to operate on his patients or whatever, <laughs> that I flunked out of medical, uh, dental school. So he found them, he prepared a video, and then he brought it back to us and, and those of us with whom he was close and who taught Jewish studies. And I, we said to him, myself included, Perry, you gotta take this to the administration. He said, oh, they're not gonna be interested. I said, it's a different school, it's a different world. And we got him to bring it to the uh, president's main assistant. The guy looked at it, he said, we have to do something. The president of the university got involved. Fast forward about 10 months later, there was an evening at Emory uh, where all the people who had been flunked out had been invited back, and they came back. And not only did they come back, they came back with spouses, with children, with grandchildren from across the United States. Some, one guy had his four sons fly in, one flew in from California, was there, and then flew right back. Um, and uh, the president of the university stood up, and he had prepared remarks, because I took them from, I asked him for them, and I have them. And, but he stood up and he added extemporaneously, he started by saying, I am sorry, we are sorry. And he said it directly to them. Now, I will go places and people say, oh, you had a dental school that was anti-Semitic. And I say, yes, but do you know what happened afterwards? And they don't know that part of the story. Or we had a swastika uh, incident on a Motzei Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was on Shabbat, and there was a party Saturday night in the fraternity row. And on the Jewish fraternity, A.E. Pai, uh, someone put a swastika. And everyone was appalled, this is Saturday night. Um, and by the next day, the president had sent out an email saying this is appalling, this is terrible. But more important was the email that came after that from the um, president of the uh, student council who said why, and was, the subject was why we are wearing blue. And he said, we are all gonna wear blue tomorrow uh, in solidarity with what this and to show that we don't believe in this, that this is, it goes against us. The next day, the campus was awash with blue secretaries, custodians, faculty, students, everybody was wearing blue. Blue bed sheets, where do you get blue bed sheets? <laughs> Hung out the window of one of the dorms or something. Um, and, but I go to people and people say, oh, I hear you have anti-Semitism at Emory. I said, yes, but you know the follow-up? Three dolts, three haters put a swastika in anti and 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 that's, we have to know the whole story. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, horrific, horrific. What happened the Friday night after Pittsburgh? America went to shul. Not just Jews. You had it here. I was in St. Louis at a conference filled with clergy and, and, and non-Jews. You know, the, the uh, Six and I, they profiled the synagogue and where, uh, what's it, Rabbi Shira Block, uh, Stutman stood up and she asked, she said, I want to know who's here. The place is packed. And she said, and she, first I'd like to welcome all the non-Jews who are with us. She expected a few people to stand up. Like 40% of the people stood up. That's part of the story too. And we can't forget it. Thank you. It's so nice to kind of end on a, on a more optimistic note. <laughs>